Well, good, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a great lunch. Um, it's an honor today to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Frances Arnold. Uh, Frances did her bachelor's degree in aerospace and mechanical engineering at Princeton, and you're gonna see she's really transcended a lot of disciplines through her scholarship over the years. She then did a PhD in chemical engineering at UC Berkeley, and is now the Linus Pauling Professor of Chemical Engineering at Caltech. Uh, she received the 2018 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her uh, cr really cool work on the directed evolution of enzymes. And I was really lucky to get to work with Francis many years ago now. It's actually 20 years ago uh, when I left her lab. I was there from 2001 to 2004. And she really built an amazing ecosystem that brought together scholars from all kinds of disciplines. And I really got the bug for interdisciplinary scholarship seeing chemists and computer science scientists and biochemists in her group coming together to think about how to engineer near biomolecules. And I think something, I was thinking about a, a memory of something that I really took away from the time there. Um, she really fostered creativity by asking us questions that we thought were already answered. Um, yet when we would start to talk about things, we realized that our understanding was maybe not as deep as we thought. I still remember, I think at one point she asked us, what is fitness for an enzyme? And we're like, we know, but then there was this deep discussion that came after. And so these are things that you know have really left a mark on me and I still ask students some of those questions because it really caused causes people to think deeply about the questions that they're asking. Um, you know, when I joined her group, most researchers in the world were looking at biomolecules, these enzyme catalysts that we have in our cells, and really studying them in a very incremental way. They'd study the structure, change one bit at a time, do a lot of really hard biochemistry and biophysics to un try to understand how they worked. And, um, those approaches were really arduous and slow. And you know they really didn't get very far in our ability to actually leverage these kinds of amazing biomolecules for useful applications to support you know, biotechnology. And Frances took a very different approach. Uh, she started to think about could you mimic evolution and sample many more kinds of sequences and designs of these biomolecules to try to understand how nature comes up with new functions and really was able to use this approach that mimics nature in the lab to show that you can create molecules with functions that you haven't yet seen in nature. And so I still remember hearing her talk in probably the late 90s when I was in graduate school and being really inspired by this. Um, she's really done amazing, not just making new molecules, but really thinking about needs for those molecules, potential applications, and, and working to translate such things in industry. And, and I should note that she's really been a, a, a massive uh, contributor to training the next generation of scholars. So I was only in her lab for a couple of years, but as I look back and look at where those folks are now, my peers are leaders at top schools like the University of Chicago, Duke, and MIT, and many more. They're also leaders in industry at companies like Amgen, Merck, and Pfizer. And so, you know, it's really an honor today, and so please join me in welcoming Francis Arnold. Well, thank you, and I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this truly amazing meeting. It's just such a pleasure to be here, and I get to bend your ears for the next 30 minutes or so about my favorite molecules. You bar the doors, because there's going to be some <laughs> chemistry here. So these these amazing molecules called enzymes are responsible for all the chemistry of the biological world. They convert that information in the cells to stuff, right? And so go, going from information to stuff is something that biology is great at. And, and biology, nature does it efficiently with very little waste and recycling and using renewable resources. It's a model for the kind of chemistry that humans should be able to perform. So many years ago, I decided I would become an engineer, not of aerospace systems, but of the biological world. 
I wanted to build new versions of enzymes that were better than nature. Better than nature, at least by my definition. So the problem was is I had absolutely no clue how to do it. Because the whole dominant paradigm was exactly what Joff said. You get the structure, which took forever if you could get it at all, and then you stare at it with your big brain and figure out what modifications you'd like to go in and make it. it took forever and it never worked. Sorry, it wasn't just slow, it just didn't work. <laughs> so I was a little bit nervous about getting tenure at Caltech, and I um, decided to try something that is well proven to work in the biological world. If you want to build something new, if you want to engineer anything in the biological world, why not use the process by which it's all come about? Right? You just turn this crank of mutation and natural selection, and all this amazing diversity and beautiful functionality comes out of that process. Why not? Now, not a new idea. You know, I, I got a Nobel Prize, but humans have been doing this for a long time. We have been making, by the process of choosing who mates with whom and who goes on to parent the next generation, we have been making all sorts of things that serve our purposes and help us in our daily lives or give us comfort. Things that are not remotely natural, right? That poodle, for example, is not even fit. It's not natural, it's, a, it's, a pro, it's something that humans made, and it's not fit because it would be eaten if it got out in my neighborhood in Los Angeles that's overrun by coyotes. So we make these things without understanding the mapping from DNA sequence to biological function, but we could do it by artificial selection. Now, in the natural world, that, artificial, that natural selection that gives rise to all the diversity is all driven by a very limited set of mechanisms, right? The underlying genes that, uh, that drive evolution, you know, are kind of fixed and monkeys go with monkeys and worms go with worms and recombine their genetic material, but you know, you're not gonna cross monkeys and worms and get anything beautiful out of that, right? And if you go out and smoke some cigarettes, you can dial in some mutations, but really you don't have much control over the mutational level. So, you know, it's a, it's a pretty slow process in the barnyard and in nature because, you know, functionality is important. So if you want to drive this process and do it on a time scale that matters for a graduate student or a postdoc without 500 million graduate students, you have to come up with the rules. We didn't know what the rules were, right? So I traded this impossible design problem for an impossible search through possible enzymes uh, and do it fast enough to get tenure. <laughs> so this is my lab mascot. So this is Wolford. Wolford, I do not, this is the Delang conference. I do not make Wolford. Wolford is a figment of Photoshop. <laughs> but Wolford is there to inspire you that in the test tube, those mechanisms for driving evolution are not so limited, right? In the test tube, because we can make any DNA we want, right? We can read any DNA we want. We can edit D any DNA we want, but we can't compose it. That's the problem. I'm, working. I'm the composer of DNA, and I'm going to do it by evolution. But in the test tube, at least we can recombine any DNA. We can introduce mutations at any level. So we now have control over the underlying DNA diversity. It's just that you have to figure out how to do it on that time scale. So I've traded the design problem for one of figuring out what is the process for doing this. Since I don't have a lot of time to go through how you know, this came about, um, I suggest you can, if you want to hear some more jokes, you can go to my Nobel lecture, which has more, uh, more detail on the process. But before I tell you about the process, I want to open your minds, right? Because now, with recombinant DNA technology, making this DNA and playing with it in the test tube, we now free evolution from the constraints of supporting life, right? Which is what natural selection 
has imposed on evolution. But now I'm the breeder of molecules. I decide who goes on to parent the next generation. So I can look for functions, things that they do that are well outside what current life cares about. And out in this unit, oh, any biologists here? I love to you know, pick on people. So I'm gonna pick on you guys first. <laughs> you guys are searching and, and studying the tiniest fraction of the universe of possibilities for proteins. If you think about all the ways you can string together amino acids to make up a protein sequence, it's very much larger than astronomical. 85 orders of magnitude bigger than the number of particles in the universe. It's a universe of possibilities and you study the tiniest fraction, the ones that have come through natural selection. I'm the engineer of the biological world. The rest of the universe is mine. <laughs> Out there, I will propose, lies the solution to the energy crisis, the cure to cancer, maybe even the solution to death and taxes. <laughs> but you have to find it. You have to find that solution out there in that wonderful space. But there are all sorts of proteins out there for us to discover. Actually, in reality, it's a good engineering problem that's a search through a very large space of possibilities whose fitness landscape, whose functions we don't really understand. So I'm searching through DNA space by making mutations and recombination and looking for enzymes that solve my problem. And what we didn't know was what's the shape of this fitness landscape that I'm optimizing on? If it's smooth, any fool can optimize. You just close your eyes and walk uphill. If it's really rugged, like over here, then really, really rugged, then if you make a mutational step, you take a mutation, you fall into a crevasse of non-function and evolution stops. And you just have to think a little bit about this problem to realize that the fact we are here to talk about it means that that landscape is smooth in some of its dimensions, right? Because the probability of making multiple mutations simultaneously and jumping to some new function is practically zero. So if you make mutations one at a time, you can find these smooth uphill paths to new capabilities. And that's what we implemented in the laboratory now 35 years ago. It's really a simple process of mutation and turn the crank of artificial selection where you take simple, oh boy, those are hard to see, take simple DNA that encodes, a, that encodes an enzyme copy it under error-prone conditions and dial in a few random mutations, not too much. Express those in bacteria, typical recombinant DNA capabilities, and then you search through the ones, one by one, to see who has these new traits that you might be interested in, just like you'd search through your cats and dogs. And then you take the ones that you like and you feed it back into the process. And the hard part really was to know what, it's a numbers game where you have to have a very tight screen. So if anybody wants to know why a Nobel Prize, as an engineer, I knew that you had to have tight screens that would allow you to see the small effects of just a few mutations. And that way we could screen a thousand things, that's not very much, and find improvements in useful properties. Most mutations are deleterious and they went into the trash can. Now I bet you can't guess where they go. Machine learning algorithms. So I'm gonna come back to that in a few minutes. So this process worked really, really well. It looks like this. You start with an enzyme you take from the bottom of your shoe. It does its natural job really well. You ask it to do something new. It's going to do new chemistry or it's going to work under non-natural conditions. And generally, like most people, it's not very enthusiastic about that. So when you ask it to do something new, almost always, especially if it's useful, it doesn't do it very well, but you turn this crank of mutation and, and artificial selection, you can drive it up a new fitness peak and train it to do something that's useful. And that actually turned out to be a highly robust process. I mean, the biologists hated it, right? Because, you know, they said a monkey can do random mutagenesis. Yeah, but it really works, 
right? And so almost all the enzymes that you use in your daily lives, from everything that's in your laundry detergents to the reagents in your DNA sequencing kits to, you know, lots of enzymes used in textiles and farming, those are all optimized by directed evolution. And, and uh, 10 of my former graduate students work at Merck implementing biocatalysis for making drugs. It's really widely used in hundreds and probably thousands of laboratories because it works at the level of function. And you know what? For that, I got the biggest accolade of my life. I got to go down to uh, Warner Brothers Studios <laughs> and appear on the Big Bang Theory. Does any, do, do, do any of you guys watch The Bing Bang Theory? Yeah, couple, couple. Yeah, it's not as popular as among my age set, but <laughs> it's about really nerdy graduate students in Caltech who start off as sweet graduate students and then they go on after 12 seasons to become you know, professors who are lobbying for Nobel Prizes. So I got to go down and play myself. I was the first woman scientist ever to play herself on The Big Bang Theory, and the last, because the show is over. <laughs> Who wants to watch professors lobbying for Nobel Prizes? But you'll probably uh, see Kip Thorne on the end and George Smoot, so they had a couple of physicists and they had to slip in a chemist to get in there, but that was a lot of fun. Uh, I also got invited to a really great party in Stockholm. If you ever get invited, you should go there. I, I guess. <laughs> So let me switch a little bit. So we developed this marvelous optimization problem, process, right? It works at all levels in, in biology, but we could optimize enzymes for all sorts of interesting tasks. But I wanted to do something even bolder, and that is to get enzymes to do something completely new. Access chemical reactions that aren't even known in biology. You can't go to a database and find this chemical reaction and optimize it. Because I had a lot of flack from my colleagues in, in chemistry. They said, oh, biology is cute, Francis. And they patted me on the head and they said, but it can't do what I can it can't do this chemical reaction that's industrially really important. And I got annoyed with that because they were pretty arrogant. But the, the other thing I got annoyed with is that people were starting to design new enzymes. And why is it a hard problem? It's a hard problem because these enzymes are so complicated. They have to position multiple functional groups, mul multiple chemical groups or amino acids to, to stabilize a transition state for a chemical reaction. That's a combinatorial problem that's just way too big. You can't make five mutations simultaneously and create a new functional active site. So I left that problem alone for many years until I realized, whoa, that's just totally the wrong way to think about it. And why is that? It's the wrong way to think about it because you know what? Nature does it all the time. Nature creates novelty, you know? All the life on Earth wasn't there at the beginning. Sorry. It wasn't there at the beginning. It came about because novelty got created. And part of that novelty was a lot of new chemistry. So for example, we dump all these nasty chemicals onto the planet, like this potent herbicide atrazine. It was thought to be non-biodegradable. And then 50 years later, somebody figured out if I cleave this carbon-chlorine bond, I'll have this rich nitrogen source that gives me a selective advantage over my neighbors. And all of a sudden, it spread all over the world because a new enzyme was invented. So how does nature create a new enzyme if it's such a huge combinatorial problem? Any ideas? I'm sure you know this, and Yusef, you know, Nature creates it because it comes out of the diversity that's already there in biology. This is why diversity is so important. Because if you have a diverse set of people or genes or whatever trying to solve a problem or available to solve a problem, the likelihood is greater that the solution will come up. And it meant that an enzyme that had that capability at some low level was already there. And it just took that 50 years for it to take over and to evolve further and be optimized. So that idea gave me a, a you know, said, okay, 
evolution has not stopped. It will continue long beyond us. And evolution of chemistry has not stopped. So there's absolutely no reason that biology can't create new chemistry, especially with a little help from me. So I started on this great example that I'll share with you. Everyone thought that, you know, this is just one example. There are many, many others that are probably more compelling, but this one's a lot more fun. Everyone thought that silicon and carbon, silicon, you know, carbon-silicon bonds were not biologically accessible. You know, there's no, you go to the databases and you look for an enzyme that's, you know, there and annotated to make carbon-silicon bonds. You couldn't find anything before 2016 when we published it. And, um, you know, there's probably 50, 100 products in this room that have carbon-silicon bonds. It's a really good example where humans have created these molecules. Biology doesn't care about them. But humans made them, and it's a big business, silicones. And they're in your, your uh, personal care products. They're caulks, sealants, paints, you name it. They're all over the place, made at billion pounds, billions of pounds per year, big, big product. And um, they always thought that it had nothing to do with biology. So we said, huh, I wonder if there are enzymes out there that really could make carbon-silicon bonds. We had a chemical hypothesis about how this might happen. So this is the, you know, the hypothesis-driven part. We said maybe a heme protein that has an iron atom could activate a carbon, make a carbene, highly reactive species. And there was some evidence that such things could happen because carbene precursors are good inactivators of heme proteins. But then we proposed that if it makes this reactive carbene, and it's not just a you know, killer of the protein, it could transfer that carbene into a silicon hydrogen bond. It had never been shown before, but it's not impossible. So we went to the refrigerator and just tried a whole bunch of heme proteins, and by golly, we found this little cytochrome C. It's a little itty-bitty protein, only 100 amino acids long. It's super stable because it comes from a hot, salty pool in Iceland. It's so stable, you can give it to a chemist. And they won't even know it's a protein. So it, that protein, and it has no known catalytic activity, but if you asked it, can you form this carbon-silicon bond. So down at the bottom, if you give it dimethylphenylsilane in a carbene precursor, it will form that carbon-silicon bond. And it will do it as well as any human chemist has ever done for this asymmetric reaction. So the protein's just sitting out there. It's fully capable of doing it. And this is kind of a funny story because the cytochrome C for the biochemists in the audience has no active site. Right? It's all you know, fully ligated. And I had an expert sitting in the front row, jumped up and said, Francis, don't you know there's no active site there? And I said, well, you know what? Nature really doesn't care what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Nature doesn't give a hoot. Because not only does it catalyze this reaction, but if you turn the crank of mutation and artificial selection, it improves. So when we got to the point where we were 50 times better than any human chemist at this, we got it published in a snooty journal. And that was a lot of fun, because when I talked about this work, it, science communication is really important. When I talked about this work, before it was published, Bob Service was sitting in the front row, and he said, oh, this is so cool, you gotta tell me about it. You know, and I said, zip my lip, because I want to get it published in your snooty journal. So he made up a story. He said, he said that we were making silicon-based life. And that was a lot of fun. Actually, you know, so any, you, you guys watch Star, Star, okay, <laughs> Star Trek, and you see the Horta episode, they're looking, he's looking for life in rocks. We weren't looking for life in rocks. But that picture and that story went all over the world. It went all over the world, so much so that when my paper was published, no one read the paper. It was 100 pages of SI, and it was a really boring chemistry paper, but they all read this article. And what happened is the story went all over the world, and it mutated as it went. And um, so popular science 
you know, it, there was nothing about silicon-based life in my paper, but <laughs> popular science says, oh, I don't think so, you know, and they might even have a chemist on their staff, so that was, uh, that was fun, and then Astrobiology magazine, they obviously wanted a different one, and I think all 17 readers of Astrobiology <laughs> magazine clicked on that article, making it the most popular article of 2017. And then, oh, Evolution News, this is the intelligent design community. They said, that's got to be intelligent design. I said, yes, I am definitely the intelligent designer. <laughs> but I'll tell you, oh, and by the time it hit the UK Daily Mail, we were putting silicon chips in people's brains. No one read the paper. <laughs> no one understood the paper. But I'll tell you, the funnest thing, so are any of you on X? Twitter, formerly Twitter. I love, I love Twitter. I, I'm not sure about X, but Twitter, you get um, reviews of your papers from all, all sorts of folks. And we were just uh, rolling, and I don't know if you can read that, that, that we were just rolling over with it, laughter that how people, how people responded to the science. So it was, it was good. <laughs> you ever had reviews like that? <laughs> but people are creative. And, and if you want to engage with your audience, Twitter is a great place to do that. <laughs> but I'll just point out, you know, we're here to talk about Brave New Worlds. The, the, you know, my friends at Caltech who, who pat me on the head, they're kind of right, right? Because you think about all the bonds in biology. Biology is amazing and it makes beautiful things, but the chemistry is limited. So if you think of the bonds to carbon that you see, you see a lot to hydrogen and you see a lot to the halogens, a few metals, but there are whole swaths of the periodic chart that aren't known in biology. And we added two whole new elements. 2016 was silicon and 2017 was boron. So now you can incorporate boron and silicon using biological systems. And nature just did it like that. It was really easy to do. Now when I published the carbon-silicon bond formation, Dow Chemical came to me and said, huh, you can, you can make these bonds, but can you break them? And that's really a, an important question, because if we think about all these silicones that are, that are accumulating, right, some of them are even banned in the EU. And, you know, they break down into these volatile methylsiloxanes, but no one knows how to, um, how to break those down. When you take a, a, a siloxane, the, the silicon oxygen bonds are easy to break. Those are pretty weak, and those um, break down into the small compounds. But the carbon bonds, the silicon carbon bonds, are the hard ones to break. So you can't mineralize them all the way to silicic acid. And that's sand, right? So that's, that's harmless. And we'd really like to have some way to break those down. But there's no good chemical means to do this as well, right? So, so these things are accumulating in large quantities as we go. And so Dow Chemical asked us to, to look into this. Could we create enzymes that could break these bonds? So what do you do? You go to the refrigerator. I have a really big refrigerator full of things that I can test. And we also had a hypothesis that particular enzymes called cytochrome P450s, which are your first line of defense against nasty things you imbibe, might be able to oxidize the methyl group on these, silo on these um, small siloxanes and break that bond. And so we screened them, you know, with something like L2. We screened and we found, but lo, lo and behold, that we didn't find any natural enzymes w that did it, but we found versions of enzymes yeah, I guess this is not really working. Versions of, en sorry, of enzymes that we had in the refrigerator from a previous project working on silicones that would take a silane to, you know, a, si a hydroxylated silane. And it had, some of those enzymes had a little itty bitty bit of activity. Now chemists know if you find a little itty bitty bit of activity, that's no good. You just go on to the next thing and try something else. But in the evolutionary world, a little itty bit of activity is a solution because 
we can turn the crank. So we took that tiny bit of activity and a great team, this was, was just published uh, two weeks ago, it was published two weeks ago, a great team of graduate students worked really hard and solved a lot of very high, you know, challenging technical problems and we turned the crank and we were able to increase the activity on L2 and then we diverged, so, you know, we're going in divergent direction and started evolving on some of the things that are banned in the EU like D4, you can't have D4 in products anymore and showed that you could keep going on the cranking of the evolution. We made the first enzymes that break carbon-silicon bonds in these um, accumulating compounds. And I'll just point out, when you, you know, this is what engineers like to do. We like to solve problems. Scientists like to figure out how the problems are solved. The science of this is going to evade us for a long time. And, and this is important for, you know, you young people. All the mutations that contributed to this, so these different divergences and the mutations that were already there, they're all over the protein. Nobody can even explain th how the mutations improve these activities, much less predict them, right? So we're a long ways away from using this, this information to predict unless we look at things like machine learning and AI. Now, let me get back to that in a minute. We're looking at a simple process. And a simple process like evolution, you know, blind uphill walk, you can automate that. You don't need a graduate student to sit there with toothpicks and, and do this. And the graduate students, after they've done it for a few times, they're really happy to automate it. <laughs> and not only, and I hinted to this at the beginning, all that information that we used to throw away in the form of mutations that don't work, that's really valuable information because we can now take that trash can and insert a machine learning module in there so that we have a test, you know, a design build test cycle well known in synthetic biology where now we can use the data, all of the data to help this process. And I'll just point out that this is now the frontiers. My former graduate student, Phil Romero, who's now for the last eight years been a professor at the University of Wisconsin, he applied machine learning methods to directed evolution in my lab 12 years ago. And now he has built, this is an incredible story, he has built a fully automated cloud lab, I mean he has, he uses a, 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 a a cloud laboratory, what's that? That means you send your data to a laboratory, you know, say in Northern California, that will implement the roboticized experiment. The data can come back through a machine learning or AI agent, and you can just push the button and evolve new functions. So this was, um, we knew this would eventually happen, but it, it has really happened, this sort of thing the transition of the information into the physical world and back now lets you go through this evolutionary cycle all completely automated. And it's just going to get better than that. So, we have this brave new world. We can move evolution into the future. We can do chemistry that no one thought was possible for biological systems to do. And so therefore we can build whole new biological futures. And what this conference is about is, you know, who should do it and what can we do? And I find that fascinating. I love to open people's eyes about what can we do, but we also need to talk about who should do it. So when I got a call in December 2020, at the height of, of the pandemic, my mother had died in a nursing home and my brother was dying in a hospital in Arizona. I got a call from Eric Lander, who, was, who told me that he was going to be President Biden's science advisor. Biden had just won the election, and he said, Francis, I want you to come with me to Washington and co-chair the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So that's me in Delaware on January 16th, uh, right before the inauguration, uh, we met with the president-elect and the vice president and um, formed the new science uh, team for the White House. For those of you who don't know, this is 
The Baker Institute does the history of PCAST, and uh, I read everything I could from the Baker Institute to try to help me figure out how to do this job, but it's an independent FACA, Federal Advisory Committee, comprised of individuals who donate their time, donate their time to advise the president. We, we're, we serve without compensation, uh, we get to meet with the president once in a while, that's our comp compensation, but we, it's a lot of work to do it, and all 28 people that we asked to serve on this committee said yes, every single one of them. We were so glad to have a president who was interested in science and what scientists had to say. So we get to meet with President Biden, uh, that's me yammering on about AI, uh, and he's, he's really deeply interested in uh, what science can do for the American people. We have uh, already, if you go to the whitehouse.gov slash PCAST, that's our website, we have a number of reports that, we, that the president asks us to tell him about, everything from semiconductor ecosystem and research needs there, biomanufacturing, wildland firefighting, extreme weather, the public health workforce, nanotechnology initiative, a public engagement with science. We'd come out of a pandemic where nobody knew what to believe and what not to believe. How do you convey science in a way that makes sense? You, know, you don't say, this is the truth, right? Because so often we scientists, we don't know the truth. So how do you talk to people about uncertainties? Uh, and patient safety, and we have another six or seven reports in the works um, for this year. I want you to look at the Braille writing on the very right side of that. When we, the science team was rolled out in 2021, written on the wall in Braille were, were these words. And I think they're really important because science Science without people is meaningless, right? We do science for people. We do it to solve problems, but we also do it for the beauty. But if you don't share it with people, it's, it, 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 it's a hollow exercise. And um, I think science should be for the good of people and that we should have hope over fear. We should have unity over division. We don't see that very much now, but we really need that. We definitely need science over fiction and we need truth over lies. So I'll leave you with that. I think it was an inspirational meth message that I found when I went to, to Delaware and I'll share that with you. And thank you for having me. Thank you for a very inspiring uh, talk. I want to connect it with some of the comments we heard earlier this morning about biohazards. And are we going there with the proliferation now uh, with our open source uh, AI models and there's alpha, uh, the alpha fold? Are we making it possible for someone to sit in a cave in Bora Bora and design bioweapons? That's a good question. So I, I think about this quite a bit. We talk about it in Washington. Um, I think, mm, how to say it? I, I'm a firm believer in technology and technology being available to people. Uh, synthetic biology is a D, do it yourself, right? A do it yourself community. The technology is relatively low entry. Right? So those sorts of things, you cannot, you cannot rein them in entirely. And the cost to doing that, this is what a lot of people that worry about these technologies, they really don't worry about the cost to reining in technology. They don't worry about the things that, that would help people that don't happen. And, the, and uh, so uh, there may be some bad actors out there, but I think that we need to be prepared to defend ourselves against the much more likely possibility that nature will be after us, right? 
Already. So, it has been after us already. It has been. And the much, much more likely possibility that nature will continue to be after us. And the same things that protect us against that also protect us against bad actors. So I'm all for pan pandemic preparedness. I'm all for monitoring you know, emerging uh, diseases. And I hope that humans don't add to the fray. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your time. My name is Jenna. I'm from UCLA School of Medicine. I have a question about how you would advise people who... Closer? How's this now? Better? Yeah? Okay. Um, I have a question about how you would advise researchers who are doing work like you that could bridge into areas of security, areas of entrepreneurship, areas of industry. Uh, like you said about nature being after us or bad actors being after us, how do you personally advise yourself when you encounter a new research project or a new research idea in a way that is ethical, in a way that is mindful to those areas of national security? And how would you advise new researchers to continue their work, to continue fighting against the way nature fights against us, but also be mindful of the potential impact we have on other industries? Well, luckily, I haven't had too much of that question because I work with enzymes. They're not self-replicating. They're I don't do directed evolution of viruses. Although if you go on Twitter and you look under my name, I'm I'm responsible for everything from the Wuhan virus to <laughs> Pfizer. I mean, honestly, all sorts of conspiracy theories about directed evolution out there. Enzymes are great because they're not self-replicating, they just do chemistry. And I've started companies, I have started multiple companies some of them are even still in business. <laughs> and, um, and, and I advise people to go solve real problems. And honestly, if they don't do a good job at solving the problem at a cost that makes sense and people don't want them, then they won't survive. They'll go extinct. Now, national security, so I've already answered, I don't really advise people on the national security because there aren't that, that implications of my own research. Understood. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Sorry. That. Sorry. No, 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 I can't okay. help you there. <laughs> that's okay. I just think it's I think it's very interesting to hear from researchers and in, in their fields how they consider things like ethics and in other industries before starting experiments. I have my own as a scientist, I have mm -hmm. always felt that and I'm an engineer. Mm -hmm. I, I've always felt that I wanted to make products that help people. So that's how I do it. I, I don't work that. on things that don't help people. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Dr. Arnold. Uh, my name is Cooper Galvin. I'm a biochemist and entrepreneur. I work mostly on heart disease prevention. And found your talk inspiring, uh, especially from the, your lifetime of service to scientific discovery. Um, my que questions are scientific. So the first one is, you have a big freezer, apparently. <laughs> and whenever you're going after a new target, like say you want to uh, form new carbon bonds with another element of your, of your choosing, w where do you start um, in searching that freezer? And then the second one is, um, let's say your freezer doesn't have an obvious solution. Is there a general enzyme? that you like to start with yeah. as you go after activating carbon, for example. Yeah, so there's no general enzyme. But if you know some chemistry, you know that iron is very versatile, right? So you might mm -hmm. say else. So we have a hypothesis based on chemistry. We don't just go willy Nature can go willy-nilly because she's got you know, five gazillion organisms all out there working crowdsourcing, right? I don't have crowdsourcing, so I have to, you know, start with a hypothesis, and that's called chemistry. Mm. So we start with the chemistry, and, and then it's a numbers game, really. And, and what's nice about that is it can all be automated, right? And there's lots of genes out there that you could search through. So if mm. you have a hypothesis that I could break a carbon-silicon bond with a cytochrome P450, and you've got access to a lot of cytochrome P450s like nature does, then you can have a pretty good chance of finding it, a starting point. Mm. Yeah. And the, the glory of directed evolution is that if you've got the starting point, you've got the solution. Hi, Dr. Arnold. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say your work is really inspirational. I'm actually a member of Joff's lab. I'm nice Sam Schwartz. Um, and my question was really, 
as you've alluded to, you've been pinned you know, on all sorts of crazy bioengineering, Wuhan virus, things like that. How should we, uh, as a graduate student, approach being able to interact better with the public and get our ideas across and engage um, so that the public has, you know, uh, um, relative like to the Assimilar Conference, um, an ability to interact with these interesting new ideas? Talk to people that you don't normally talk to and listen to what they are thinking about. Listen to what their concerns are. We all talk to each other, right? Scientists are great at talking to each other, but we don't talk enough to other people. And so I find that, a, that listening to their concerns and listening to people who come from way different communities to mine, that teaches me a tremendous amount about how to convey what, I, what I'm really interested in, but also how to modify what I'm interested in based on things that I continue to learn. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Miriam. I'm also a student in Joss Lab. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, my question surrounds more the political side of your scientific involvement. I'm really interested in knowing how you, you choose what kind of science to convey to maybe non-scientists who are making difficult decisions, and how do you decide where to draw, I guess, a line in terms of policy? Do you c divulge all information completely? Do you have agendas that you seek to follow? <laughs> I'm not an expert on policy, and I'm not an expert on scientific communication. I'm good at communicating what I'm interested in, but I think, you know, there's a lot of expertise, which we should use, right, in the social sciences. We should learn from the social sciences on how to communicate effectively with people. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Otto. Thank you so much for your talk and for coming to speak with us today. Uh, I'm a research technician in Dr. Sherry Gow's lab, and I want to say congrats on your illustrious career, but I want to take you maybe a couple steps back. If you could give some advice to uh, an upcoming uh, PhD student as to, you know, maybe what you would do differently or things you would do to maneuver the time, because I feel that's uh, I have the kind of naive sense of, you know, I want to save the world, but that's, you know, not possible in the, in the time span. But when you kind of get to your point, what do you feel like helped bring you to the point you're at? Thank you. I hate giving advice because everybody's Sorry. path is, is so different. Um, all, I, all I can say is that what served me well was keeping my eyes open and changing direction if I wanted to. I started off thinking I'd be an aerospace engineer. It was the end of the Vietnam War era. Everything was shutting down. So I went into solar energy. Then Reagan was elected, right? So then I went to biotechnology, and woo, that was, that was good, you know? And, and so I tried different things. And if I wouldn't change any of those things, because all that knowledge is like money in the bank. You put it in your pocket, and you draw it out you know, at some later stage. And that's what gave me the ability to think about a problem very differently than had I been trained all the time to be a structural biologist, I would have just thought like everybody else. And the whole point is that if you need to solve problems, you, you can't think like everybody else. You have to get those ideas from wild places. Okay. So keep your mind open. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Sergio, and uh, an initial warning, I'm an architect, and chemistry was by far my worst subject in school. <laughs> Mine too. I didn't take chemistry until I was 25, graduate school. Yeah. I was, a, I was good at, very good at calculus, but architecture school also killed that part of my brain. Um, but anyways, um, a lot of what, I mean, this conference is called Who Decides, and it seems to me that, well, from your brilliant work, it is a person who is deciding, sometimes even the market, market forces are deciding out of this mechanism of imitating evolution, which in essence produces diversity, is ultimately co uh, condensing to a point and a purpose and a function, right? So... Like a poodle. Like a what? Like a poodle. Like a poodle, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, then that's what humans, that's the human perspective on who is deciding, right? Like yeah. I want a fluffy white curly haired dog, yeah. um, you know, but it seems that nature in itself, what it's, it's, I mean, like we can't speak and, and we can only 
take the voice of nature through the arts and other forms of human language, maybe not necessarily science, in the terms that nature is seeking diversity and like uh, complementarity in different forms of life helping each other thrive. And it almost seems, at least in my interpretation, that that's contrary to what your direction of evolution works. So I would just, my question is, what if the decision of techniques like the ones you're developing are are done, or those decisions are done from the perspective of an animal, or a, a, a form of plant life, or even mineral life. Like, what would that look like? Have you made that imaginative experiment of like, what if I produce an enzyme that repairs the habitat of a certain species, or a certain network of species? I, I haven't ever created new, you know, a an enzyme that would work in an animal. I haven't ever done that. I, I, I can make bacteria do all sorts of weird things. But um, animals, that, that's a whole other level of engineering. But it's more like taking the perspective of that animal, like not seeing it as a human watching an animal and an animal's needs, but like seeing through the lens of another life form or species that is not human. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to think like a bacterium. <laughs> it's it's uh, yeah. Now it's interesting. It's an interesting. Uh, I haven't done that experiment, but maybe you can help lead me through that. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about it. Later. But I'll just point out, and I want to leave this lesson with you, is that evolution is the most powerful design process ever invented. There's nothing like evolution. It works from molecules to entire ecosystems, through animals to ecosystems, and human beings have had an enormous impact on all of those levels, right? So we've had a huge impact on evolution, and we continue to do so. And my feeling is that if we learn how to use that in concert, we could have a much better chance of living in concert with the rest of, of life forms, right? That's my goal as a person, is to figure out how do human beings live in concert with, with the rest of life. So and it may have something to do with you, oh, yeah, the way you think. For sure. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Arnold. I have a question. Um, you said that there is like an endless possibility to what we can discover with enzymes and all the new science. I just um, wonder if there is. Um, something that you think we should be barred from? And do you think that scientists would get lost in the amount of possibility that we have and uh, create something dangerous? Yeah, that gets back to, I mean, evolution creates lots of dangerous things, right? Nature has done a really good job at, at things that go after us. And it's not impossible to think that you could use the methods that I've talked about to, you know, change the infectivity of a virus, right? Gain of function experiments. But that's, you know, I, I would never do that. Yeah. So I think we have a responsibility. I think what you're getting at is we scientists have a responsibility to think about the experiments we would and would not do. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Mackenzie Jones. I'm in the Bioscience and Health Policy Master's uh, degree program here at Rice. I first want to just thank you so much for your time. Um, as a woman in STEM and someone who's going to be entering the medical field, you know, this talk in and of itself really inspired me. It's bringing together other areas of intersectionality that are a huge motivating factor for the kind of leader that I want to be and the kind of physician that I want to be because I think that there is a huge overlap, of course, you know, with the work that you're doing. But I want to pause on that and ask you, like what I said at the very beginning of my statement here is as a woman in STEM, what are some of the barriers that you have faced in um, your attempt to really evolve the world of science, evolve the policy of science? And what is something, I love to ask people this question, something you wish you knew that would have basically modified the way you have gone about your career, your professional career now? I never look back. Okay. I just refuse to do that because you can't change the past. Right. And all of those experiences, bad and good, make you who you are. Yeah. And so I just look forward. Yeah. Um, well, and I didn't know anything. So no, there isn't any. Actually, there is one thing I wish I knew, okay. which is be really nice to other people. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. I was not really nice to other people at the beginning. I'm nicer now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I like um, your stance on not looking back. I, I guess maybe part of my own education, um, I've been taught to look at what went wrong and then how to make modifications moving forward. <laughs> What's your, what's your take on that? No, I mean, it, we need to pivot. Yeah. If things are going in the wrong direction, you have to be flexible. Absolutely. Right? The world is changing fast, and Absolutely. we're going to see that with AI, yes. synthetic biology and AI. The world will change very fast, and the ones that pivot right. don't go extinct. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so okay. much. Well, thank you. This is such a fascinating talk and topic. My name is Alberto Aparicio from the University of Texas Medical Branch. I'd like to ask you a question about the historical context of your work. And I happen to see many similarities between directed evolution and artificial intelligence and machine learning in the sense that you give, you enter some parameters in the system and you, and you play on, on, on chance and variability to, to, to arrive to an outcome in a similar to way to how machine learning works without necessarily knowing how the system operates. Um, yet to what extent um, the, the evolution of your thinking has been uh, evolving in parallel with, with AI, have been taking different, uh, different paths, so have, it, have they converged at some points? Yeah, definitely. They've definitely converged because we generate a lot of data with directed evolution experiments. Sequencing now, we can get all the sequences and labeled data for those, so then that leads into machine learning. And now there's so many data, we can do, use generative AI and treat DNA like a, mo- a, like a language. So we can learn the language of life and generate whole new proteins that are really different from anything that we had before. The real challenge is to make something useful, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. My name is Adrian. I'm a synthetic biologist, a PhD student here at Rice. Um, my question was, it seems like these fields like synthetic biology and genetic engineering, they require problems to be present in order to solve them. Um, to circle back to our conversations about utopias, what, you know, in a future where, let's say, those problems are absent, they're all solved, what, what do you envision fields like genetic engineering uh, doing? Like, what, what would genetic engineers be aiming for without problems to solve. Sorry, I was on a White House call this morning, so I missed the utopia dystopia. But I don't believe there will ever be a utopia. As long as human beings are around, there will always be problems, right? So <laughs> we can solve all the things we think are problems, and humans will just make more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pam, and I noticed your lovely pin that from here looks like a stingray. Okay, and I noticed you were wearing it in some of the photographs as well. I was wondering if there's a special connection. It's my good luck charm. Okay. Come from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. (laughs) Early in my career, the Packard family gave me a fellowship that allowed me to have children. I couldn't afford to have a nanny, so I used the fellowship to have a nanny, and I thanked them, so I wear this for good luck. There. (laughs) <laughs> Hi there, thank you very much for your talk today. Um, my name is Mickey, I'm a student here at the Baker Institute um, in public policy. And one thing I want to know is you have, you're on a panel with other scientists like for advising the president, right, like in America. What can diplomats do to help kind of unify the scientific community through governments like around the world you know like because it's, it's just like for us but there's a whole broader community I'm obviously as you know there's a Nobel laureate and I feel like we're using science as a competition in diplomacy a lot nowadays and I think that that kind of culture needs to be changed a little bit like how can we do that as diplomats as people in foreign policy yeah I, I, I totally agree I mean science, science is our universal language as is as are the arts right the arts and science. Science, we all, we can communicate in science even if we don't share a language. And we can communicate in the arts. So collaborations in science, exchanges, bringing these brilliant students to the United States, and hopefully some of them will stay here. All of these things are good for our country 
and, and are, are a good basis for making sure we keep good relationships with other countries. Yeah. Thank you. Well, please join me in thanking Francis again for a wonderful